We're ready to go, Mr. Chair, when you are. Thank you. Thank you. We'll call the meeting of the Planning Commission to order this Wednesday, May 3rd, 2023. We want to welcome our Parks and Recreation Advisory Board here today. Members, thank you so much for being here. Uh, could staff call roll, please? Pearson? Here. Paul Wegman? Present. Philip Combs? <laughs> Lynn Larson? Present. Brian Parsons is excused, as well as Robert Estrada is excused, and you have reached quorum. Don Daniels. <laughs> here, I'm here, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Thank you, appreciate it. Uh, before us, we have the minutes of um, April 19th, 2023. Do you have any motion? Motion to accept the minutes as written. Second. Okay. Mr. Wagaman, second. Mr. Pearson, first. So, we have any discussions, changes to the minutes? Hearing or seeing none. All those in favor by saying aye. 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 Objections? Abstentions? Hearing none. Minutes are approved as written for the April 19, 2023. Any changes to our agenda tonight? No, Mr. Chair. Thank you. At this time, uh, we will open up public comment. Anyone wishing to speak on any subject uh, to the fellow commissioners and myself um, are able to do that. Um, if you are here tonight on the continuation of the uh, proposed 2023 plan amendments, um, you might want to wait um, because we'll have a continuation of the public hearing. But this is an opportunity for anyone online or uh, in person to speak uh, under public comment. So I don't have a sign up sheet uh, under public comment. Anyone wishing in the audience um, to speak under public comment? And seeing none, Ms. Spear, do we have anyone online that is wishing to speak under public comment? If there's anyone online who would like to testify, not during the public hearing, but during public comment, which is on any other topic uh, that could come before the commission, please raise your hand. All right, no, Mr. Chair. Oh, thank you. So we will close the public comment at this time. Okay, we're gonna open up uh, the continuation of the, um, of the proposed 2023 comp plan amendments uh, regarding the 2023-03, 2023-03, 05. So we'll have a continuation uh, of that um, tonight. So Ms. Spear, if you would. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just have a very couple of brief opening comments before the uh, additional testimony is taken this evening. Um, as you all know, just but for the record, uh, the resolution 2022-15 set the docket for the 2023 comprehensive plan amendment package. Nine proposed amendments were uh, included. And then the Planning Commission now has had its study session March 15th, opened its public hearing on April 5th, continued it for all amendments through the 19th, and then continued until this evening the hearing for 2023-03 and 2023-05. Updated language for both of these items were included in the packet for this evening. And since then, additional amendments have been um, included in the PowerPoint I'll walk through. So once again, moving target for all of you, I do apologize for that. Um, the commission is currently scheduled to take action on the entire docket on May 17th. But as we mentioned before, if you decide on the tonight or the 17th that you need more time, you are perfectly um, able to do that. So in addition to the hearing tonight, this is very quickly the other seven amendments. I won't read them out, but you do have seven others. Public hearing is already closed for each of these. For 2023-03, um, this is the one that is related to the Lakewood Racquet Club's uh, updated application. In the call for applications last summer and fall, the request was made to rezone the parcels you see with the stars uh, to OSR or Open Space Residential 2. However, since then, the Racquet Club has uh, changed its request to go to um, Neighborhood Commercial 1 or NC1. And if you remember last meeting, the staff came to you with a suggestion of Neighborhood Commercial 2, because that description of that use was more appropriate for. 
more appropriate for the um, type of use that is going on on the racket club property. However, there was comment made at the um, hearing last time suggesting that maybe a different option could be considered given the other allowed uses within NC2 that could potentially happen on these parcels if the racket club were ever to close. So tonight we do have options in front of you tonight, but no staff recommendations. I will come back to this after our public hearing 05, which is the one regarding emergency housing and shelter, as well as permanent supportive and transitional housing, as well as foster care facilities. Also, there will be additional conversation after the public hearing closes tonight, but different this evening are a few of changes to the technical requirements for when a provider wants to apply to um, construct or reconstruct a structure for this use. And also there is a uh, change to the idea of having this happen citywide for emergency housing and shelter and perhaps an overlay be used instead. So we'll go in more detail with that again after the hearing. Otherwise, Mr. Chair, happy to answer questions or turn it back to you. Any other questions? Um, just we'll continue on with the uh, public hearing and, and public comments. So at this time, did you have a comment, Mr. Larson? I just wanted to talk to uh, O3. Uh, for a moment, the uh, verbiage that uh, was uh, added in blue the, that uh, puts it in the open space recreational uh, zone uh, as where it would be a conditional use uh, mm -hmm. seems to play quite well with the situation at hand because there isn't a uh, defined project on the table and uh, uh, in, in uh, uh, with regard to the NC1 and NC2, uh, I, I would object to those because they allow so many additional things uh, over and above the intended use. And uh, we could just keep it simple uh, to uh, work with the uh, existing format. Uh, it's it's uh, Lakewood Racquet Club is a welcome member of this community and, uh, and will do things right. There was a, a view that uh, one of the other zones was more conducive to more impervious surface. Uh, and that's not necessarily the most important thing, however. Uh, the, uh, the open space recreational zone provides for a minimum of 20 foot buffer on all sides. Uh, that uh, could be used for uh, uh, for uh, retention, detention, landscaping, and uh, could make for a very nice looking project and gives lots of options available to, uh, to build out uh, what could be the, a really fine uh, attribute to this community. Great, thank you for your comments. Okay, we'll call the uh, first uh, that has signed up for the um, continuation of the 2023 comp plan amendments in the, um, of 23-03 or 05. I'll talk to, uh, we'll welcome up um, Mr. Dr. Paul Whitaker. Um, if you would come up and state your name and just the city you reside in, please. Paul Whitaker, Gig Harbor, Washington, um, Vice President of the Lakewood Racquet Club. Um, first, a uh, brief We've been around for 60 years, the Lakewood Racquet Club, and we're getting it ready for another 60 years. We're a nonprofit 501c7 organization. We currently have four indoor and six outdoor courts. The uh, demand for tennis has increased. The USTA says that we could use another 20 indoor courts in the South Sound area. Racquetball is the fastest growing sport in the country, and uh, we've lined off one of our indoor courts and one of our outdoor courts to have four racquetball courts out there. So we have uh, double use for them. Um, the YMCA has social programs to the north and we provide a service to the South Lakewood neighborhoods. As far as socializing, we have men's night on Mondays, sorry, women's night on Mondays men's night on Tuesdays and uh, mixed men and women doubles on Thursday nights with potlucks afterwards from time to time. We have uh, Clover Park High School, Lakes High School in the past Pacific Lutheran University who have uh, used our courts when needed. Life Christian has no uh, 
uh, tennis courts and their high school teams are out on our courts at 6.30 many mornings. And we don't charge them for that service. Junior programs are available now, and we'd like to double the size of our junior programs in the future. Just a note, adults and kids don't have to be members of the Lakewood Racquet Club in order to take lessons at our club. So we are open to all in the community. Lakewood Racquet Club's a good neighbor and helps out our community. I'm here to help uh, ask the panel to endorse our rezone request to NC2. OSR2 just uh, won't work for us and a copy of our defined project architectural site plan provided by Guerrero Arch Architects is going to be given to you by Mr. Bill Pareto, who's following me. And uh, Mr. Guerrero used to be a member, I believe, of your planning mm -hmm. committee. Mm -hmm. So with your permission, I'll be followed by Mr. Bill Pareto. Okay, great. Thank you for your comments. Yes, Mr. Pareto, please come up, state your name in the city you reside in, please. Hello, my name is Bill Peretta. I'm a resident of Fircrest. Um, I'm also a retired architect, as mentioned last time. I was kind of dragged back into this project. I'm a member of the club tennis club, obviously. Mm -hmm. but, um, not a good tennis player, but still working on it. Been there 32 years. And so uh, my game has 32 years older. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. all I can say on that one. Um, I did receive the a letter from the planning commission on the proposing the amending the open space recreation. Um, before I start with my discussion here, I've got some handouts I want to pass out. <clears throat> These are all numbers, stat numbers. Um, I did a um, a workup sheet on what the existing and new impervious areas will be for this club here. On the second sheet is a, um, a site plan that James Guerrero did for us, mm -hmm. shows the, the, the master plan build out for the proposed um, project. Um, the impervious areas that we have, just to get six new indoor courts in here, we need six indoor courts, and then we need parking for those indoor courts and we need a fire access and a fire loop road. And that will take over 269,750 square feet. And our property area is um, 493,100 square feet. So roughly it's a 55% impervious, we're taking up 55% of impervious on that 12 acre site. Um, so on my bottom part of that sheet there, I did a comparison between NC1 and OSR2. Um, the uh, NC1 does give us the height we need, the setbacks we need, the parking we need, the impervious, everything we need to make this facility work. The OSR2 zone, we cannot fit that building on that site and make it work. This doesn't, it's over the 30% impervious, obviously. So, but I see that there is a um, uh, amendment to giving us the open space and recreation to designation, which I, you know, I, it sounds more palatable, but I like to see maybe there's a hybrid system, a hybrid, we can take, put this in the OSC zone and then bring in the NC requirement for a tennis courts. We need a building that's going to be 40 plus height feet height for high ball tosses and or high ball um, activity and, and and parking and building size and ten, outdoor tennis courts, a lot of impervious areas. So to, to make it work, we do like the, I mean, it's a hybrid. We're taking the OSC uh, and, and throwing the tennis courts into that zone per, being permitted and then put in the, and work with the city on working and getting the, um, um, the building coverage, impervious, and um, setback requirements will, will make, make all those work with the, in the OC. So I don't know if that's a, an avenue for us to work, but, um, but the OCR won't, won't work for this site for us. So, um, but I, 
a, do we do like the, um, the, the rezone to, um, you know, not rezone, but uh, amendment and putting that it's per permittable, permittable uh, use. In fact, if that's gonna be required, I mean, if tennis courts are allowed, they can't build tennis courts. They'll be functional because they have the height and width and space that so takes up a lot of space. So maybe there's a kind of a, um, we call it a, a mutual agreement of a, doing a hybrid to the, not changing it to NC2 or NC1, but an outdoor rec space. Great. With these exceptional, I mean, these uh, conditions of height and, and, for the, and impervious, that's the biggest thing. Yep. Awesome. Thank you. Thank so, you for your comments. We'll take, take under advisement and move forward. Thank you okay, for your comments. You. Appreciate it. Ken Inslow, come on up. State your name and the city you reside, please. My name is Ken Inslow, and I'm here, reside here in Lakewood. I helped the planning when they were forming the city. So I was a volunteer back then. So mm -hmm. I just thought I'd throw that in. Sure. Um, uh, first, um, during the process, we started back in September, August, September of the rezone, the um, actually the pre-application process, then the rezone. Um, we uh, got the SEPA analysis just within the last 30 to 60 days from the city of Lakewood. And boy, they, you got good staff. They nailed the, the, the sentence. And I'll, I have this to give to you. And it's, it's the actual SEPA from the city of Lakewood. And they, um, the analysis for rezone from MR1, what we are now, to NC2 or OSR2. So that hits the topic exactly. And then, um, Number one, is the proposed amendment consistent with the countywide planning policies, the Growth Management Act, other state or federal law, or the Washington Administrative Code? Yes. Um, and uh, then it's, uh, okay, yes, this zone of three parcels would remove the non-conforming status from an existing and successful ongoing business, that's our LRC, uh, business concern while also providing clear development standards on the parcels, on the parcels should project actions be submitted for approval by the city in the future. I hope I pronounce it right. Okay, that's number one. So they're, they're for the NC2 on that. Uh, would the proposed amendment have little or no adverse environmental impacts? And is the time required to analyze, ana analyze impacts available within the time frame of the standard annual review process? Yes, this is a non-project. We'll be later coming in for a permit. So um, unincluded persons would be reviewed. Okay. Uh, is sufficient analysis completed to determine any need for additional capital improvements um, and revenues to maintain a level of service? And is this time required for this analysis available within the time frame? Yes, this is a non-project. So we're another positive. Can the proposed amendment be considered now without conflicting with some other comprehensive establishment? Yes. Um, because we're in that normal cycle of amendments. Can the proposed amendment be acted on without significant other amendments, revisions? And again, because we're not applying, but it's yes. Um, if the proposed amendment was previously reviewed, uh, that's not applicable. But now we're, I'm ending this real quick here is they say, the CEDD recommends redesignating rezoning parcels, our three parcels, uh, from mixed residential and open space, the OSR, to neighborhood business district uh, slash NC2. So the city staff, as of 60 days ago, was a proponent of our NC2. Um, 
Uh, and it, it, they brag that it will literally pull it. Well, here, the, the racket club is a non-conforming use as of now with those with the OSR and the MR, but it, um, it serves more than the local neighborhood, which is a use more appropriate for NC2. And then I promise I'll cut it real quick here is um, request to redesignate those three parcels to neighborhood business uh, NC2, redesignate it to NC2. Um, Uh, and then it, it ends with recommends approval of the amendments. So up until recently, we were there. Um, now, um, and I won't go much longer. Um, the city of Lakewood had one complaint. I know Barbara Wyatt. Barbara Wyatt is a good friend of mine. And she's a heck of a tennis player. Barbara Wyatt endorses all the development of the tennis club. She's for the pickleball. She's for the tennis. She's for increasing the kids' tennis programs. But I disagree with Barbara that the LRC can variance. Which, what you're going to ask for us, if you're the OS, is you're going to say, oh, well, you need a variance for that. Well, Josh Kibbutz with your city staff said, you won't get a variance for that. It's too big. We're used to little of adjustments as well as you're looking for, um, if, you, if you can plead your case to the hearing examiner that you're gonna go broke if you don't get it. But he says, you're not gonna get that. And we're looking at right at this time, three major variances to, to make this happen. And there might be a few other little ones when we go through the permitting process. Um, we need this NC2. We invite the planning committee, all of you guys. I know Lynn's been there a lot of times in the audience or the up above watching the tennis. Um, uh, we invite you all to come on out, take a look at what we're doing. I can walk you where we're thinking about adding the courts. And um, let's get behind this. Let's get more t kids playing tennis. Let's keep our seniors, you wouldn't believe the seniors moving around those tennis clubs. It's really good and all the socializing that goes on down there. And I'll end it with, has anybody got any questions? Not at this time. I okay. Don't see. Thank you so much, Mr. You Ezel. betcha. And Thank here, here is yeah. the uh, SEPA. Great, thank you for your comments. Those are the three that we have signed up. Anyone uh, else in the audience wishing to speak uh, on the uh, proposed um, Comprehend uh, 03 or 05? No one in the audience, so how about online? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I believe Mr. John Grant is here to testify um, this evening for the comp plan hearing. Great, Mr. Grant, welcome. State your name in the city you reside. Go ahead. Uh, good evening, Commission members. My name is John Grant, and I'm the Chief Strategy Officer for the Low Income Housing Institute, or Lehigh. I reside in Seattle. I am testifying today on the proposed amendments to the city's comprehensive plan. We are the operator of the former Candlewood Suites, now Marine Howard Place, offering 80 units of enhanced shelter for homeless people. The site will offer 24 seven staffing and case management services. And at a later date, this project will convert to permanent supportive housing. Lehigh also operates over 70 properties in six counties across Puget Sound, many right here in Pierce County. We have greatly appreciated the work of the Lakewood Planning Department staff taking the time to engage with us and other stakeholders. We believe the latest draft of the comp plan amendment is a major improvement that is far more in compliance with state and federal fair housing laws. We especially appreciate the work of Tiffany Spears in finding solutions that will work both for the city and housing and shelter providers. The new draft contains a number of compromises and in some areas, areas we still take issue, such as the thousand foot siting restriction. Ensuring compliance with state law will be, a, will be crucial to meeting the city's affordable housing and shelter targets. According to the State Department of Commerce, the city of Lakewood will need to develop 637 emergency housing units, 
and 1,238 permanent supportive housing units serving people earning 30, uh, below 30% area median income, which is uh, within the city limits by 2044. Currently, there are only eight family shelter beds and zero adult homeless shelter beds within the city. If there's any hope of reaching those goals, then adopting the current version of the comp plan amendment is the best route. We will be staying engaged on this issue and appreciate the commission's time and thoughtful consideration uh, on this amendment. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Grant. Appreciate it. Anyone else online wishing to speak? Um, if there's anyone else wishing to testify as part of the public hearing, please raise your hand. Uh, seeing no. Looks like no one else, Mr. Chair. Great. So again, anyone else in the audience wishing to speak, uh, hearing or seeing none at this time? Uh, so does any of the fellow commissioners have any comments? Or would Mr. Buer? If the commission is satisfied with the level of public comment, this would be the opportunity to close the public hearing. And after closure of the public hearing, uh, come back either at this meeting or at a future meeting to start talking about specific issues. Okay, I'd like for us to maintain the process or, or we'll end up going long and we have other people in the room and online waiting to talk about the next subject. You got it. I see um, Mr. Andrew Wells. Is that Mr. Andrew Wells? Ms. Wells is watching us and probably would like to maybe speak about the urban forestry plan. Okay. No problem. So many of the other people here are students from University of Washington who are on online. Okay, great. So um, then at this time, um, we will close the, oh, excuse me. No, no, no. Yep. Thank you as well. All three of you as well. Thank you. So then um, right now we will then close the public um, hearing on the proposed 2023 comp plan amendments, 2023, 03 and 05. We will close the public. Make a motion to do that. Um, you can either make a motion in a second or the, or the chair can close just the public close. hearing. It's your choice. Yep. We will uh, just close the public good hearing. Good hey, job. listen, man, you pay me the big bucks. So, so thanks, I appreciate it. Um, Okay, now we can move on to the next on our agenda. And tonight the agenda is unfinished, uh, no, the presentation of the Urban Forest Implementation Plan. And we have the UW Evans School for Public Policy in governor, governance students with thank, us. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. And all of the students are online tonight. So you'll see Jamie, Ala, Marlon, and Sam. They're going to be making the presentation to you this evening and also to the Parks Board. So again, thank you all for being here. And then um, the intention is once this presentation is done, they are here to answer any questions or, or take suggestions from you. They're scheduled to go in front of the city council in a few weeks. So if there's any edits that you would suggest for them to incorporate into the format for, uh, or the substance for this report before it gets to council. Now's the evening to do that. So I'll turn it over to the students. All right. So who's gonna speak first uh, to us tonight? Thank you, Tiffany. This is Marlin here. Jamie is gonna uh, share the screen for us with our presentation so we can get started. Thank you very much uh, everyone for having us here tonight. Um, like I said, my name is Marlon Sanchez, and I'm here joined by the rest of our group, Ala, Jamie, and Sam. And we have uh, titled our report, Establishing the Roots of Urban Forestry in Lakewood, Washington, an Implementation Guide. And in the next slide, you're going to see briefly the agenda that we're going to be covering today. First, going over the background for this report and how we started working about it the research methods we used for the results. And in the third place, you're gonna see what we have titled the roots of effective urban forestry, which are some pillars that we have identified for the framework of this plan. And then we're gonna move on to our main recommendations for the city. And then we're gonna close with the conclusions from our report and we're gonna have time at the end for questions. So we would ask you to please keep your questions until the end and we'd be happy to stay here to answer them. Um, 
So next, uh, the city of Lakewood in their energy and climate change chapter included these two goals um, related to urban forestry. First of all, increasing the city's urban tree canopy cover from 26% to 40% by 2040 and developing and promoting an urban forest management plan in the near term, which is what we have been collaborating and doing and what we expect especially related to goal number two, that this implementation guide can help the city uh, get this urban forest management plan started. And then based on these goals, we developed a five-year urban forestry implementation guide that is based on um, the city's organizational structure, community needs, as well as taking in mind the financial limitations that the city has to dedicate to this project. Uh, moving on to the research methods that we used, first of all, we developed a literature review uh, going over climate and environmental impacts, as well as public health benefits uh, related to public to urban forests, as well as community engagement, as you will see further on the presentation, is a very central component to urban forests throughout the region and in the country. We also uh, conducted secondary analysis of data, uh, such as data from Planet Geo that was collected for the city's tree code update. We used some of that data to analyze uh, Lakewood's current context. Uh, we also conducted semi-structure interviews with uh, the Washington Department of Natural Resources, other cities in the region uh, that we were looking at their experience very closely to learn from it as well as uh, leading nonprofits in the environmental and urban forest uh, topic. Finally, um, we also did a case studies approach uh, where we looked closely at the cities of Issaquah, Vancouver, and Seattle and their urban forest programs, especially because they had environmental uh, similarities with Lakewood being in the Pacific Northwest, but also we made the selection for these cities based on the characteristics of their plants and their longevity, as well as uh, two relevant indicators that are uh, used in these uh, realm. First of all, the tree equity score from the American Forest Organization, which measures whether there are enough trees for everyone in the community to enjoy the benefits associated with trees. And we also looked at the tree city recognition from the Arbor Day Foundation, which uh, tests and promotes a framework to maintain and grow uh, tree cover in the cities. And then uh, based on what we learned from these uh, methods and what we looked at from these cities that I mentioned, uh, we can move on to the next slide. And we came up with what we are calling the roots of effective urban forestry programs, which is, first of all, a resource assessment, um, a community engagement component, and finally developing administrative capacity within the city to, the level, to develop this program. Then now Jamie is gonna walk us through our first recommendation. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Marlon, for that. I'm gonna jump right into our recommendations. So our first recommendation for the city is to develop a mission and vision statement, as well as desired outcomes and goals for the urban forestry plan. Uh, so here we have drafted versions of the mission and vision statements that we thought were important. Uh, we include these in our report. Um, uh, but I mainly want to talk to you about our desired goals and outcomes, so I'm going to go a little fast through this really quick. Uh, so our desired outcomes for this plan, we want to focus on forest health. So this includes like appropriate tree planting, making sure we're planting the correct trees, uh, invasive species control, making sure that this forest is going to last a long time. Um, tree population expansion, this is very similar to that tree code review with the new um, uh, regulations to increase the canopy over the entire city of Lakewood. Community engagement, uh, obviously it's a main root of urban forestry in general, so we want that to be a desired outcome for this plan. So we want to regularly engage the public. We want to make sure that they're not only uh, 
uh, active through volunteer work, but also just surveys and getting their input in general. Uh, equitable access to benefits, uh, like Marlon said, we wanted to make sure diversity and equity inclusion is uh, a big part of this plan. So we wanna make sure those benefits are felt throughout the entire community, not just for a certain group. Uh, and sustainability, not really in the climate change kind of sense, but in a financial operational sense. So making sure that this plan can last for years and years and doesn't uh, need to be restructured completely, that it, it, it starts very strong and then can continue. So uh, going on, our second recommendation is following that first route of urban forestry, um, which is resource assessment. So we ask you to complete a comprehensive resource assessment and begin ecosystem management in the city. So what does that mean? Resource assessment in general, um, through our case studies and through our interviews, we uh, learned that this is one of the biggest, most important first steps of an urban forestry program. Uh, so it basically uses uh, different techniques to evaluate the current canopy, the health of the canopy, its distribution throughout the city. So the first step of that is using remote sensing, mapping, uh, satellite imagery, GIS, et cetera, to map out different management units or MUs. We use that terminology a lot, so that's what that means. Uh, so once you map out those MUs, you can select what's uh, appropriate for ground assessment. After doing that ground assessment, then you can go in back, look at the data of that ground assessment and prioritize what type of management goes where. So for taking Lakewood into context here, where you guys are at, uh, you basically have completed that first step um, with the tree code ordinance, um, you uh, hiring Planet Geo to do a uh, canopy assessment. Uh, it was very thorough, took into consideration equity, um, um, surface temperature, uh, and potential open spaces that new trees could go into. So we decided to use that data uh, and suggest that their um, prior prioritized planting areas uh, shown here um, in the different census groups are your first MUs that we believe you should focus on. Um, so now we did we did a little bit more analysis looking at public versus private land to see where the city could kind of start right away on public lands um, and where other strategies for private land would need to be done. So we looked closely at that unit six in the uh, northeast corner of the city. So looking closer a little bit, um, this is the zoning areas of that um, management unit. Uh, so as you can see, there are a lot of open spaces here. Uh, it, we recommend to start at this one because it also has, uh, it's the largest MU out of all of them. So there's a lot of areas you could potentially start. And uh, it also is near a other census group. It's just north of one that has a very low tree equity score. Uh, so this would help combat any um, negative um, uh, issues along associated with that score. So next steps after selecting what MUs you would like to start with, we then uh, recommend you utilize the forest landscape assessment tool <clears throat> or FLAT. Uh, so this was a tool developed by the city of Seattle that is basically simplifying the on the ground assessment. It's different than a full tree audit. Uh, it takes a lot less resources, a lot less time, and it simplifies the data you get from the on the ground assessment to a single digit. Uh, so you can see here, this is basically the main metric that you would use for different criteria, maybe soil health, uh, uh, tree age, uh, um, access to water, things like that. You would pick that criteria, then rate it based on this table. And so that data that you get is pretty easy, easily um, like digestible by any staff member that has to determine what management goes after that. Uh, so uh, the city would need to determine what relevant criteria you'd use, like soil health, tr uh, current tree numbers, et cetera. Uh, but we give you a list in the report of what we think is relevant, but the tool also has all the different uh, possibilities that they developed throughout making that tool. So looking forward to next steps in general for the resource assessment, we want you to first, like I said, implement that flat assessment. This is probably going to be done by a, a, an, a professional arborist, um, and you have to select that criteria first, like I said. After implementing the flat assessment, we want you to look at those scores to figure out what maintenance is necessary where. This is going to be a lot where a lot more accurate uh, budget assessment is going to come in once you get an idea of where invasives are, how much control you're going to need to do for that, maybe where there, how many trees you could potentially do. A lot of very specific detail is going to come from this point. 
Um, then you're also going to be able to do our next point, which is identify where professional help might be needed, maybe where you use nonprofits or contractors to come in, usually with like high invasive species, you know, you might need some pesticides there that volunteers aren't licensed to use. Uh, then we also would just recommend to utilize best restoration practices throughout. So that invo involves making sure you remove invasives before you plant. Once you plant, you monitor that sapling um, and it implement long-term stewardship throughout that plant's life. And then we also recommend to develop a private land strategy because as we know, uh, Lakewood is mostly private land. So there is a lot of room to expand canopy there, which goes into our next recommendation, which I will hand over to Sam. Thank you, Jamie. And I will go through the community engagement section, which is part of the rules of an effective UFP mentioned before. So in this section, I will present the importance of community engagement for UFP, followed by the strategies we designed for the city of Lakewood to best engage with the community. So first, why community engagement? Well, it is essential to develop a UFP that aligns with the interests and needs of the liquid community, as a successful UFP depends heavily on the robust support and active participation from the residents. It is also necessary to consider various aspects of accessibility and representation for the diverse community in the city of Lakewood when designing and implementing these activities to ensure equity and inclusivity. Meaningful community engagement can increase the number of trees that are planted overall but also results in sustained stewardship that increases survivability, which is critical for community members to enjoy the long-term benefits of increased canopy coverage. So the strategies we've designed for the City of Lakewood include the following, and the full rationales and implementation logistics can be viewed in our full report. So the first one is to host community meetings to acquire public comments to incorporate into the UFP. This includes identifying a meeting with community leaders first, then conducting town hall meetings with residents in several locations, including community centers for underrepresented populations. So second is to launch online public service which can be incorporated into the existing surveys identified in the 2021 to 2024 goals in the city council agenda. These surveys can be used as complementary tools or community meetings to obtain additional valuable input from community members and start acquiring the public's opinions on the responsibility of the right-of-way trees. Third is to construct a volunteer system. This can be divided into three consecutive steps, recruit volunteers, which can be conducted in outreach meetings and partnering with esteemed community associations, built a forest stewardship program, which allows the city to have more experienced volunteer leaders that can implement restoration projects, lead volunteer events, and work in coordination with the city staff. As well as appoint a volunteer coordinator, who based on the budget selection that Marley will talk about in just a second, can either be one of the city staff that is identified as neighborhood coordinator in budget one, or the full-time program administrator identified in budget two. And fourth is to host tree-related workshops for private owners to educate them on better planting and maintaining their private trees, as well as enlighten them on the tree regulations published in the most recent tree ordinance. So next, I will hand it over to Marley, who will talk about our fourth recommendation. Thank you, Sam. Our final recommendation um, relates to creating administrative capacity within the existing organizational structure in the city. And then you're going to see that we have come up with three uh, potential approaches to this recommendation. The first one be that we have titled here on the screen, option A, would be to create a standalone urban forestry advisory board that would oversee uh, the plan implementation would uh, support coordination among city departments that would be um, implementing different tasks of the program. And this option would also ensure community participation as this advisory board would be um, having volunteer members as part of it. And this option would also not require that the city hires a full-time employee initially for the program. An alternative to this option is option B, which would be expanding the responsibilities for the Parks, Recreation, and Community Services Advisory Board to then integrate the urban forest uh, priorities. Uh, with this option, though, we do recommend that the city hires a full-time program coordinator um, to support the work of coordinating with city departments, all the tasks that the plan involves, and this option still carries on that component of community participation through the advisory board. Uh, but we do think that having a full-time program coordinator can support uh, the work of the PRCS board that already has a line of work and expanding their responsibilities would um, without a doubt increase their, their work. Finally, uh, 
Option C would uh, imply not having a standalone board or expanding uh, the Parks and Recreation and Community Services Board, but hiring a full-time program coordinator to then take on fully the coordination among city departments for all the tasks that, as you are going to see next with ALA, are going to be distributed throughout city departments. And uh, you can see that we have not listed community participation in this option, given that uh, even though community engagement will be part of the implementation component, um, there would not be that direct community involvement in the administration of the program, uh, contrary to having an advisory board. Then Ala will take us through the second part of this re recommendation. Thanks, Marlon. Hi, everyone. I'm going to start out by talking about our priorities um, that we have identified for the first five years of the program. These priorities are based on our prior three recommendations, as well as the outcomes that Jamie talked about in the beginning. Um, most of these continue for the first five years. The beginning of those are coordinating contract arborist work. And I'll talk about some of these a little bit more in detail when we get into the budget. Um, the goal is that um, a lot of these are coordinated across city departments, primarily community and, econ community and economic development, parks, recreation, and community services, and public works and engineering. So the first one we've identified is coordinating contract arborist work, um, community outreach and engagement, volunteer recruitment, and exploring external partnerships and funding. Those would continue for all five years. Um, evaluating and updating surface water fee usage, which I'll talk about when we get to funding sources. That's a priority we've identified. Standardizing citywide tree maintenance practices, not only for internal city departments that handle planting and maintenance, also for contract operations and maintenance, as well as public facing documents for Lakewood residents for when they begin planting trees and do maintenance on their trees. And then the last one that we anticipate will continue, hopefully for the life of the program, is coordinating these priorities, um, the planting and the maintenance across city departments. Um, and so from these priorities and from our recommendations, we've identified two separate budgets. Um, so we have a budget one, which encompasses our option one, or option A, excuse me, which is for our standalone urban forest advisory board. Um, that's the first option you see here in green. And then we have budget two, which encompasses options B and C, which is no standalone board. And that includes if um, the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board absorbs urban forestry priorities. Um, so that's that kind of encompasses budget two. Just to talk quickly about the trade-offs of these options and the trade-offs of these budgets, with budget one, which encompasses a standalone board, you are going to have increased staffing and funding associated with the new board. Um, whenever we do our estimates, the, the funding is somewhat minimal, but we do recognize that it requires a lot more coordination. And there's a lot of initial um, work that has to be done to get a board off the ground in a city. Um, the benefit is that it ensures that urban forestry activities are prioritized across the city. Um, and along with that, because with this specific budget, we're not rec necessarily recommending the city hire a new full-time employee, day-to-day -day urban forestry activities are going to be carried out by current city employees. And because of that, those current city staff may be at capacity, which could limit their ability to actually do urban forestry activities day-to-day. -day. This option also requires increased coordination um, that's led by the various departments. And because of that, responsibility for these activities are not centrally held anywhere. And looking at the trade-offs for a budget two, there are increased expenditures for a new hire, for hiring, onboarding, and supervision. Um, because this option does not have a standalone board, we do recommend you hire someone. The benefits of that is that urban forestry is the sole priority for that employee. Um, there's one person who is coordinating that cross departmental cross-departmental collaboration every day, um, and the responsibility would be central, centrally held by the department where this position is held, um, which in our budget we've outlined that could potentially be the city manager's office. 
We've included um, on some additional slides the full budget estimates, but just to give a high level overview, you'll see in year one, this 248,000 for budget one and 258,000 for budget two, that's the total estimated expenditures for year one. You'll notice there's a very minimal difference. That difference is solely based on staffing. In budget one, we have estimated a percentage of current employee time be spent on urban forestry activities, um, a percentage of two employees from CED, a percentage of one employee from Parks and Rec, and one employee from Public Works. So there's a little bit higher of a cost for budget two because of the new employee. Um, the professional services are the same across the two budgets, 135,000 in the first year. That includes the flat assessment that Jamie talked about, hiring a contract arborist to do that work, as well as having a contract arborist to um, make recommendations for work in the city. That's about $35,000 for that contract arborist, which is actually already in the city's current biennial budget for both 2023 and 2024. Um, in years two through five, obviously that $100,000 for the flat assessment goes away, and instead we have estimated um, expenditures for contract planting, planting and maintenance. Um, that cost goes up in years two through five. Our hope is that the city will increasingly plant more trees, but there's also the hope that the city will have more and more community engagement to help with that planting. So um, it's not necessarily a one-to-one -one as trees go up, um, contract maintenance goes up as well, which you can also see in our main budget. And then the supplies estimate is just based on current city supplies um, numbers that we were able to pull from the city's 2023-2024 biennial budget. Um, and you can go ahead and go to the next slide. Jamie. Um, one of the big questions we know is going to be how do we pay for this? Um, there's a We've identified four main ways that cities typically pay for their urban forestry activities and programs. The first one is the general fund. Um, the city can obviously allocate a specific amount for urban forestry activities or potentially set a percentage of general fund revenue aside for these activities, similar to the 1% that's currently set aside for human services in the city. Um, one of the most innovative ways that cities fund their urban forestry activities is through the usage of stormwater and surface water fees. Um, the city of Vancouver, Washington has been using this revenue source for a very long time. Um, their urban forestry program is over 90% funded by a percentage of their stormwater fees, and their estimated um, their projected expenditures for 2023 is about 1.8 million. And all of that 1.8 million is expected to come from stormwater fees. Another example of a city using these is the city of Issaquah, who's actually hiring a full-time urban forester. Um, I believe I've actually already hired them, but they outlined it in their 2023 budget. And it's about 180,000 was the estimate. And it's all being paid for with that stormwater fee. Um, the city can also explore nonprofit, public, and partner private partnerships. There are many local, state, and federal grants that the city can apply for. Um, this obviously does require staff time to apply for those grants and uh, look for those partnerships. Um, and we have outlined a comprehensive partnership guide in our full report. And then the final revenue source is the city tree fund that's outlined in the um, tree ordinance update. And those funds can also be used for purchasing trees and for other urban forestry related activities. So just in summary, these are our four main recommendations. We recommend the city develop a mission, vision, and outcomes for urban forestry. We recommend the city begin by completing a comprehensive resource assessment, um, developing a really comprehensive community engagement strategy to involve Lakewood residents, and then creating within the city administrative capacity um, so that this program is sustainable in the long run. And that is our presentation. So at this point, we can take any questions that you may have. Great. Thank you all for your presentation. Very uh, well uh, presented and uh, a lot of efforts have went into this. So we thank you. First, I'll ask if the, um, you know, the uh, Parks and Recreation members, if you have any comments, questions um, at this time, if you have any specifics, you can step up to the microphone 
or if anyone online, I see Alan, Jason, and our online Alan, if you wish to go ahead and speak. Uh, I just want to ask if they got the entire uh, report that was submitted by the ad hoc tree committee uh, for this uh, study they've done. They've done a really good job. Yes, we did get access to that um, as we were preparing. Yeah, because there were probably uh, 150, 200 uh, community responses that were included, which was uh, quite overwhelming, but actually very good indication of how much this is important to our community. Great. Yeah, thank you, Ellen. Thank and you. J Jason, do you have any comments? No? Uh, anyone else from the inside here? See, no one else has got their hand up. How about uh, Mr. Larson? Uh, how long, <clears throat> excuse me, how, how long do you expect this project to last before you've got the umbrella built out to, uh, to gold? Hmm. Any one of you can answer that. Mr. Chair? Yes. Is the question about whether the tree canopy goal of 40% uh, no. by 2040, how long that might take? Is that what you're asking? That answers the question. I, I'm, answer, I'm asking the question uh, from a financial basis. Uh, you've given a first year budget. You said it's a two to five year perspective. Uh, it seems to me as though if we're going to plant uh, a substantial canopy. It's going to take some time. And how, how long is that? How long are you giving yourselves to get it planted out? Mr. Buer. Uh, part of the the problem here was how do you establish an urban forestry program from scratch? <laughs> and um, this is, you know, city is relatively new. This is a new program. We just amended the tree preservation code. We have climate change core, uh, uh, action plan of one of the items included in with this. So the direction was for the students to move forward with an implementation plan on a five year period and sort of slowly move into this so that the city council and other departments can adjust and, and uh, get to the point where this becomes a full program for the entire city. So you see a buildup in funds. And if you go to some of the appendices, you'll notice that there's by year five, about $450,000 for this program. I would imagine that on an annual basis, a $500,000 uh, urban forestry program is not unreasonable if you wanna be successful with it and obtain your 40%. Mm -hmm. So they were asked to start slow and sort of uh, give the, the city the opportunity to, to get into this. And if I can just expand on that a little bit more. In last year, 2022, the planning department spent about 15% of its budget on tree-related issues. Okay, so that's about $200,000. I think we're already spending roughly thereabouts. Okay, so that means we're doing all the enforcement, which is proactive. That means we're going to court. That means we're collecting fines and penalties. And in addition to that, we're reviewing projects for site development when they come in. So in many ways, we've already started this program, but there's more to the program than just the development review process and enforcement. There's the other pieces of being proactive and getting the community involved in this program. Who's going to run this on a long-term basis? One of the big questions, and I'm bringing it forward, is do we have our own tree board or not? Or is this something that gets subsumed by the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board? That's a big question. That's going to have to be asked or answered at some point. So I'm bringing that forward a little bit this evening. And before I go too far, you do have a person by the name of Andrew Wells, Mr. Chair, that may wish to provide some testimony a little later in the meeting. He's a public citizen, but also represents um, a group uh, looking at climate change issues and things of this nature. So, okay. Thank you. Yep. Anyone else have any comments or questions? Mr. Combs. Hey, great work, everyone. Uh, I know you put a lot of time into that and it, it was evident. And uh, we appreciate you doing that for us. I know this is a, 
something that you're helping us out with as we're trying to solve this uh, challenge in front of us. Did was there any um, was there any at any point um, acreage identified as to how much we're going to need to meet this goal if we were to assume we met this 40% goal. I didn't know, notice that anywhere. At what point do we know, hey, we've arrived? How many acres is it? it is, I see you nodding. And so go ahead if you, if you do have it. Yeah, so um, I, I can add some to that. And Jamie, if you want, also feel free to add to it. But uh, we do not have a specific acreage because that will depend on many factors such as the type of trees that you plant. And there are many indicators that are going to come from your resource assessment and being able to actually identify the areas that you're going to be able to grow. So for us, we could we try to work with an estimate of how many trees we need by acre, which is easy to know when we have the conditions of the land, the condition of the surrounding areas, what you could get from the uh, resource assessment that Jamie talked about. And uh, once you know specifically the type of trees that you would be planting, we did include an appendix in our report with um, different species that can um, are suitable for Lakewood's environment and ecosystem, uh, but that are other steps that we or the city would need to take to know for sh for sure how many acres or how many trees you would need to plant uh, to achieve this goal. Um, yeah, thanks. I, I think that would be a, kind of a, a good number to identify uh, whether it's um, depends on the tree. That may be the case on how many trees you need, but it still is providing the same amount of canopy correct mm -hmm. like an acre's worth of canopy is a you know could be different trees but you arrive at the same number at the end of the day so I think using land you know acreage would be helpful just to identify what that that is so I was looking at um, you know as we go through this the recommendation was to go with smaller parcels, even smaller parcels than we had recommended to um, help with this canopy coverage goal. And some of these parcels would be very difficult to be able to put another tree on. And so I didn't really see any focus on where would you replant, what's the alternative route? And maybe I missed that or it's in your appendices, but um, that might be something you might consider adding in your presentations, you know, knowing that we have so many people that maybe won't be able to replant on their property. You know, if, you're, if your property is uh, 11,000 square feet and you have a garage and a house and, and the only places you plant it are going to tear up your foundation of one or two or the paths, then does it make sense? And so is there another alternative place? And have we identified enough of those where, because it seems like there was interest from people and um, environmental groups on where we could put that. And so maybe identifying that as uh, early on and saying, hey, here's, here's the solution to the problem we know is coming down the road. Um, that's one thought. And then um, I was going to ask about uh, how about gearing up instead of starting off real heavy. But then I realized this was the gear up after I listened to staff. So uh, I won't, I won't uh, ask that question. And um, I think all the rest of it's been answered. Great work. I will say the one recommendation I have uh, would be to not put a lot of emphasis into stormwater fees, which is really just a taxation uh, versus pulling from a general fund. Um, you know, I think that uh, there's we've got to be able to come up with m more more options than a, a what would seem like a tax. And all of the, you're absolutely right. You can come up with a lot of funds from from stormwater. It's just um, the optics of it. I'm not sure that it gets us the the equity we're looking for. So I and it could it taxes people in different ways.
Yes, Mr. Buer, comment? Uh, on the stormwater uh, discussion, that it's not about increasing fees, that's taking the existing fees mm -hmm. and reallocating them differently. So we, we these are already the stormwater funds. Yes. Where would they be pulling from? Well, well, if you already have stormwater fees, they're going to something. They're, they're going to a variety of different things. Uh -huh. um, oftentimes they go into city road projects and it helps uh, write down a percentage of that. There may be also some stormwater fees going in for other projects in the city. The ones I'm most familiar with are road projects. I, I, I guess that's all, I, you know, for reallocating, you were pulling it from somewhere else. Where is that going to get it? You know, at some point, someone's got to pay. Well, ultimately, that's going to be a city council policy decision. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it's just something to be mindful of. I, 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 you've got to be careful when it looks like a new, a new tax. I, I would also point out that HB 1110 is going to have an impact on this because mm -hmm. we're supposed to be providing additional housing and we're going to run into issues with locations of existing trees. And how is that going to be resolved? We attempted to address that with the new code, but that's something that we'll prob probably have to look at again at some future date. Yeah, Agrees. Ms. Spear. Thank you. Mr. Gerwin has his hand up. I believe he's a member of the Parks Board. Okay, great. Go ahead, Mr. Gerwin. Jason, go ahead. Hi, thank you, Chair Daniels, for uh, the opportunity to speak. Um, I just wanted to speak to uh, Mr. Brewer's comments, and um, I have not had a chance to vet this with or talk this over with the Parks Board, but it's uh, kind of my, my personal feelings. And so uh, those would be that um, I believe that the, the parks board, um, has an interest in, and, uh, trees, uh, we, you know, in my personally believe trees are the answer, um, and maybe a vested interest there. I do know we also have a, a busy, uh, calendar. So I think it's a coin flip, um, whether you do a separate board or have it be the parks and recreation, um, advisory board, um, I could make a case for both. Um, and then in terms of uh, staffing, I, I, I firmly believe that um, it's in the best interest of the city to hire a dedicated staff for that. Uh, staff have a, a lot of extra duties as assigned already and uh, a full plate. And so I think that extra staff is needed. Uh, and so I just wanted to provide those comments. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jason, as well. Um, go ahead, Mr. Uh, Pearson. Um, yeah, in your guys' um, evaluation of uh, the stormwater fees, and there was a couple other ones out of the uh, general fund, the, the last one was the, um, was there any evaluation into the tree fund? Um, is there any idea on how much money that's going to generate with the new tree code? Is there any idea of, you know, some funds from, from what's been done with the new tree code? Uh, there's currently $50,000 in the, the tree fund. Uh, that number goes up and down. Oftentimes, the money is through enforcement actions. Mm -hmm. It's been over $100,000 on certain occasions. Um, there is also a potential for half a million dollars coming in for one, one specific project uh, to, try for, to pay for uh, mitigation. Mm -hmm. So that tree fund uh, will vary in amounts, but it is rather significant. Um, a process. I would also point out that we just purchased, I think, 60 plus Oregon oaks uh, for $5,000, and those would be planted in the fall. So, and that's part of a road project. So, we're actively using those funds. It was also used to assist in planting uh, native vegetation around Wahop Lake several years ago. So, where are those trees in various areas, those ones you just purchased? Oaks. Well, we haven't planted them yet. I oh. assume that they're going to be in some location in Fort Stillicum Park. Okay. Great. We'll see. And more details on that. Great. Um, so before we go to Mr. Wells, does anyone else um, have any recommendations or step up and state your name and from the uh, Parks and Advisory Board? Thank you. Uh, Vito Yakubatsi, Vice Chair, uh, Parks and Rec Advisory Board. Um, a couple things. One is uh, thank the UW uh, group for putting this together. That was great. Um, it would be nice if we had an opportunity to get a copy of that mm -hmm. so that we could understand Just it more and, mm -hmm. and dive into it a little bit more. Uh, it was fast. There was a lot of information there. And it's hard to comment when you're <laughs> getting all this. Um, I know we went almost automatically to this canopy 
goal, you know, uh, by 2040. Um, it seems like we've got, looking at Lakewood, this is a general comment. Looking at Lakewood, we've got parks that has a lot of tree canopy. We've got some streetscapes that have some tree canopy. And, and then we have the residents, right? Residential properties that have some tree canopy. Do we have any idea of a percent in each mm -hmm. of those categories? Mm -hmm. And I know we're, we're not, we have not developed our parks or our uh, parking strips and our streetscapes to its full need or its full potential, right? Um, so maybe this question is for you, Dub. Uh, do you guys have any idea at a high level, 10,000 feet, whatever, is that divided up somehow? Yeah, so we have some of those numbers, um, mostly from the data that was gathered when the tree ordinance was updated. Um, I, I, with Lakewood's 26% of urban tree canopy, about 72%, I believe, is on private land. And then the other 28% is on public land, but I'm not sure what the what the split is between parks and right of way is off the top of my head, but most of it is on private land. So uh, another comment is, uh, and I, I agree, I think pri private land has a fair amount of can canopy. One of the things that I've noticed is that, uh, and you have it in some of your uh, recommendations, is tree evaluation for health. What's the health of those trees? You know, I know invasive species are all over the place. I drive through Lakewood and all I see is ivy. Mm -hmm. And we know that ivy's not good for trees, not for the long term. So that, that's a real important piece. I like the assessment piece of this whole program that you've put together. That's really important. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank Mr. You. Buer? I would just uh, like to point out about the timing of behind this. They basically start this in December and have to have it completed by around May in order to meet their requirements for graduation. So they are on a tight time frame, <laughs> and, and the amount of work that they performed and met with city staff and made all these iterations and changes it is a significant amount of work. Uh, there's no question that there needs to be more time spent on this but it's also important that the students complete their assignment. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, we get tied up in this, these kinds of problems and knots, but, you know, that's part of the explanation as to why the board has not had the time to review this that they should. Sure, no problem. Great. Um, anyone else from the comments, suggestions, ideas on, you know, A and B or one, two, three, or all those? Uh, go right ahead. Thank you. Um, I'm Janet Spingath. I'm on the, the parks board too. I'm a forester and I used to teach forestry. Um, I would definitely follow Jason's comments on putting a confidence in a, a professionally trained urban forester rather than allowing, trying to, to manage this otherwise. There's a lot of um, consideration that goes into trying to get, uh, to balance ecology, balance trees. They have special needs. Um, you can't just say we're going to have you know, increase our canopy here and plant X, Y, Z and have them survive. Mm -hmm. So um, I definitely would support an urban forestry professional. Great, thank you. Appreciate that. Okay, uh, any other comments then? Hearing none, Mr. Wells, would you like to speak before us tonight? Uh, sure, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, yeah, I'm Andrew Wells, and I'm out of Olympia, out of Olympia, um, and I'm the outreach manager for Citizens Climate Lobby, and this is a national um, climate lobbying um, nonprofit, and we focus pretty much exclusively on the federal delegation, specifically House membership. So we share that, uh, you know, our representative, um, Representative Strickland. Um, and we've been engaged with her for um, a number, uh, for quite a while now on the policy priorities that we have um, at CCL. And specifically, one of those policy priorities is uh, healthy forests and urban forestry. So it's been great to be able to learn a little bit more about what Lakewood is doing in this space. Um, and, you know, the, the presentation of this plan going forward, um, I appreciate it. So thank you. 
Great, thank you for your comments. I see uh, Mr. Gerwin still has his hand up. Are you wishing to speak again? Sorry, that was an errant mouse click, my fault. Hey, no problem. Just always want to give opportunity. Thank you. Um, any, any other fellow comments? No, no comments? Okay. Um, again, I thank the uh, UW students. Great job. Um, I'm sure you're going to get a, a good grade on this um, project. Um, thank you again for all your efforts. Um, and we look forward to hearing some uh, feedback uh, after you get that big old graduation certificate, you know, diploma. So um, thanks again. And uh, any feedback uh, on the results, um, we would really appreciate that. So thank you again for all of you. Great. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, thank you for your time. Good. Absolutely. So no other final comments? No? Oh, waving. Go okay. dogs. Waving at me, jeez. No comments from Mary, jeez. Okay, great. Um, so we thank you, you as well, the, the Parks and Recreation um, Board to be here, advisory board. So we do have some unfinished business moving on. We have the uh, commission um, discussion 2000 planning amendments. If we wanna have a, a final discussion on those amendments, um, any other further comments on 03 and 05 that you wanted to ask or quick? If I could just make yeah, a few more comments, it. Mr. Chair. Um, so apologies jumping in on you once more, but this again is the 2023-03, that's the Lakewood Racket Club uh, request. What you have here in front of you is, there are various types of facilities which are currently allowed in, in several zones. One is called a health and fitness facility, either commercial or quasi-public. And these are commercial for-profit indoor facilities in summary. And then there's what's called the sports and active recreation facility, which is outdoor. If you were to look at, sorry, you can't see the top, but these are the NC one and two permitted or conditional uses. And so for instance, on the left column, you see health and fitness facility is permitted outright in both NC1 and NC2, and this is where the early recommendation came to you from staff that that would be the option instead of changing to OSR, open space recreation. The sports and active recreation, the outdoor option are not allowed in either zone. If you go to the open space recreation one and two zones, the commercial facilities that are mentioned here and quasi public are not even listed as options at this point. And then there is the option to do a conditional approval, a conditional use application for the outdoor version. So there's really no easy fit for what's been discussed. Um, this is a quick summary of some of the development standards that were mentioned by the people testifying tonight. So uh, the neighborhood commercial one district require, or has a maximum, I should say, of 70% building coverage and 80% impervious surface. NC2, it's 10% higher in both of those. OSR2 doesn't even have a building coverage um, number because it's intended to be open space, correct? And then the impervious service limit is 30%. And that's where you heard the testimony saying they didn't think they could meet um, that requirement with the improvements they wanted to do for the six new courts. So you basically have these three options. Um, taking a look at their original request from the racquetball, uh, racket club, to go to NC1. It's not really suitable just by how it's defined as a zone. And it also allows some of the more intense non-residential uses if the club were ever to close. NC2, again, it is suitable for the use, but it's again, those more intensive uses that were raised at the last part of the public hearing. The third option is going with- Ms. Spear. Um, I'm sorry. Is, is it possible to just get, have you tell us what the headers are there since they're covered and I couldn't, when I printed it off, it didn't show. It's development standards, um, neighborhood commercial one district, neighborhood commercial two district and open space recreation. Okay, thanks. Sorry about that. The third option is um, going with the open space recreation two zone and changing the zone to allow um, the, the operation of a health and fitness facility. However, this would work in terms of the type of use, but as you see, the development standards at this point would not um, allow outright the current project. And the question of whether to change these requirements for the citywide zone, that is a, a, a topic that the staff wasn't ready to recommend. 
So um, looks like Mr. Buer has his light on as well yes, if he Mr. wants to add. Go ahead. Uh, there's no easy fix here. Um, I could not recommend to the Planning Commission or City Council we develop a specialized custom zone to meet their requirements. Uh, and I would ask that the, count, the commission put the hat on of beyond this request, what else could be allowed on this property over time? And, and I say that after many years of experience, people coming in and saying, this is what I want to do. And for whatever reason, it doesn't pan out and we end up with something different. And then everyone's upset. And then everyone is, is talking about, they said this, but then the city allowed this. So you have to put on that long-term perspective when you look at these zoning districts. A couple of comments too about the SEPA review that was done. That pertains specific, specifically to the aspects of the environment. So yes, we do ask those specific questions, but there's also another set of questions that we ask when we start taking a look at code amendments. And that's outlined in the code. And I do believe that Tiffany does place that in. At the end of the day, this is all entirely legislative. So the council can do whatever they want. And so, but they need to have the basis or findings for it. But I do want to point this out. I also do uh, want to, this is a little uncomfortable, uh, to point out that for Commissioner Larson, whether or not he has a conflict of interest on this. And I need to bring that to your attention, whether or not you choose to recuse yourself or not. But that is something that I think is important for the public on the aspect of transparency mm -hmm. that I bring to the, the board's attention because the last thing that we want to do is do this wrong and have to come back and do it over or be subject to some sort of no, legal I, process. And I, I had wondered about that. Uh, and and uh, actually asked the question earlier whether I would have a conflict of interest or not. So uh, certainly I would refuse myself on any vote. If, if you wish to pursue this further, I would suggest that you contact City Attorney Heidi Walker and explain your situation prior to taking a vote and then she can provide you some advice on the subject. Oh, okay, no, it's okay. I, I don't mind uh, refusing myself uh, at all. Uh, am I allowed to participate in the, in the conversation? But not vote. My question, yeah. Or, or is that a Heidi Walker question? Yeah. I, my preference would would be that if you're going to recuse yourself, that you're not in a position to sway the rest of the board members in, in conversation regarding this amendment. Fair enough. Fair I, enough. I'd love to make some comments to get this started because these recommendations are great. I, I mean, I know you're in an impossible situation. <laughs> Um, without marrying these up and that you already answered my question, how feasible is a hybrid zoning for something like this? I mean, um, I, I'm still, I guess, let me preface this all with, I'm a fan of the racket club. I want to see them grow. I want to see this expand. I want to see all of this happen, but I'm not a fan of creating pocket zoning without consideration of the impacts on neighbors. And um, it doesn't mean that they aren't a good neighbor, but it, it does mean that they could not be a good neighbor if this ever changed hands. And um, we don't know what the future will hold. And so I, I think for that reason, I have some reservations, but would like to get creative. It, me personally, it would be very open to how we could prove it. And so I, for that reason would be a fan of OSR2 um, unless there's something else we could do that is not a neighborhood commercial zoning or mixed residential uh, or uh, even though it's already mixed residential it'd be a uh, conditional use is there if we go as OSR2 now we are unable to build because of the the uh, restrictions there well, is, if I could, actually, yeah. what, what we're saying here is these are the permitted outright standards. If you went with a conditional use permit with some discretion on the part of the staff and or hearing examiner, you may end up with a different result. It's just not permitted outright. Good. Yeah. So we I, that's what I would propose. I would be a fan of that. So you would have the conditional use review. I believe that the, I, we'll need to check on this. We'll bring this back at your next meeting, but the conditional use permit process does allow the hearing examiner to amend some of these standards that, through a public hearing process. 
But let us check on that. Please, yeah, please do. I think that's important. And and I think that, you know, the the folks who came in today, you know, we, I don't, they talked about who they are and what they do. And I don't think that's a, a question or an objection from, or at least from the feedback I heard last time, there's no objections to that. It's a matter of how do we fit this into the zoning box that there is. So if there's another solution staff has or recommendations you come up with later, email or send it along so we can review in advance. I'd love to love to see that. And I have no trouble making an exception for what they have planned. I don't know it's up to the hearing examiner all the way up to whatever the NC2 zoning allows. Um, and if there is a way of doing it, like he said, a hybrid version and the hearing examiner allows something like that, you know, great. But I, I would be for it under those circumstances. Mr. Um, Pearson. Yep. Um, yeah, I would echo the same comments there. Um, I would, you know, be weary of, of, of changing to one of these commercial zones um, just with the unknown potential of what could happen um, in that area, um, you know, in those surrounding neighborhoods on all sides. Um, is there so so with with OSR two? Is this still are they still up against the ropes with three major variances that they would have to 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 overcome? Or what is if if what we were just talking about would occur if you did a conditional use permit instead of changing the rules, if you will, in OSR two citywide yeah. to be permitted outright what they want? Um, yes, there would be the process of applying and having a hearing examiner decision. There's discretion there, um, and the conditions would be case by case if in the future somebody else within um, OSR tried to do something else in another part of the city. So it's not the same level of um, dismay. <laughs> I don't think that you're hearing from the Racket Club people right now, because right now OSR2 doesn't allow it at all. Mm -hmm. And so we were, we're trying to take it one step further, but there still would be public hearing and discussion by uh, staff and the hearing examiner. Mr. Buer, oh, go ahead. Uh, just the last, so, you know, if we change the max impervious surface on OSR2 to accommodate for something like this, I mean, what are the ramifications of that throughout the rest of the city? Yeah. It's pretty uh, massive. Mr. I mean, Buer, I yeah, I have some concerns if we do that. The other thing that I would also point out is beware of cascading circumstances, because if you go with NC2, you have a church to the east, that would love to have their vacant properties zoned commercial. And then beyond that, <coughs> you have the old police precinct. It's currently zoned public institutional is being used to so, for social services. But that would be a great building at some time if they wanted to convert it into commercial. So now all of a sudden you have a commercial strip along Otter and Dwell. Yeah, I was I was gonna say it is that something the staff is been eyeing down the road because based on the what we heard tonight, that was a recommendation to go with NC2 or NC1 on the property through SEPA. So if that was a goal, then maybe we need to back up and then relook at how do we have the whole street zoned? Because I, I, I don't want to say never, because at some point it will be needed. But I just, to me, it didn't seem like now was the time. Uh, and so I, I would say well, stick with the OS. To, yeah, to, I'm sorry, to be perfectly frank, the NC2 recommendation came from staff before mm -hmm. staff who developed that report was aware that there's a master planning process going on for the Racket Club, which is more extensive than <laughs> six courts. Gotcha. So um, given that fact, coupled with what was voiced in the, in the hearing at the last meeting, uh, the decision was made by staff to say, okay, we're not going to recommend anything. <laughs> Pass the buck over to the Planning Commission. Um, but to go back to Mr. Pearson's question, on this map that you see here, all of the dark green is where the OSR2 acreage is, and it totals, um, sorry, 468 acres. Mm -hmm. That's backwards. I'm sorry, the lighter green, I'm sorry, um, is the OSR2. And so you could potentially have this impervious surface or the other development standards applied on all of those properties in the future if you were to change the zone overall to say, these are the new rules. So that's why, again, staff was saying, let's not necessarily change everything in OSR2 citywide. Let's just see if there's an option to deal with this one more specifically. So I have, oh, go ahead. Uh, and one 
one comment onto that is, you know, that that's not to say that they can't, you know, I guess uh, they would be pretty restricted on doing anything in those other areas though, right? I mean, there's very limited, you know, impervious that you can, as far as structures or, you know, things like that go. I mean, wouldn't it be kind of, you would only be able to do like a sports facility and some, you know, related activities like that. I mean, it's not like you can just go put a parking lot out there, right? No, this, and this chart right here shows you all of the um, various uses that are allowed right now within OSR1 or OSR2. The column on the right hand side is OSR2. So any of those either with the P or the C is something that could happen within the OSR2 zone citywide. But again, if you were to change the development standards with impervious surface and maybe the setbacks and the building heights, you would you could be seeing different types of development coming to the yeah. city as an application. Mr. Combs? I, I was just gonna check with staff on the comments about um, that we heard about uh, variants being not infeasible and um, objectionable to that. Any comments? Is there, is that true? I guess is, is it, it really so prohibitive that they couldn't ever really do this. I would like to think that if it went through a hearing examiner it would get its due run through and, and yeah. we would like to see it move forward. Yeah, I think the reason that um, response was given <clears throat> by staff is if you look at the second row here, the impervious surface numbers, 80% is the limit for NC1, 90% is NC2, and only 30% is OSR. And if you were to look at the language within the liquid code about how far you can stretch with the variance, they were presumably saying, you're not gonna get from 30 to 80, you're not gonna get from 30 to 90. So there are, I think, alternate paths that we would ask to explore and come back to you with, um, where maybe it's not one or the other here, but maybe we're coming up with something else. Yeah, I was gonna say the same thing when they just said oh, uh, OSR2 would not, they couldn't build their projected project as of today, the Correct. way it's laid out, they could not build it under that, um, uh, designation of OSR2. Correct. So I do have one other question um, on the, is, uh, first of all, does anyone else have any further comments on just on that, um, on the uh, O3? Because I, I do, well, yeah, go ahead, Mr. Wegeman. I, I guess the only comment I would make is when you, you, when you look at this from a community point of view, is, is this the right thing to do? Mm -hmm. uh, but we, we have all these uh, codes and rules so that we don't let things get out of control and 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 then yet have some fairness for everybody that's that's playing by the rules mm -hmm. um but then when you have in a sense this is a little bit of an exception um you know as they listed tonight there's a whole lot of things that people get help with um and certainly i mean i just look at from the school district point of view i mean we're using those facilities to keep tennis for our young people. Uh, and, and that seems to me pretty, pretty important. Um, but then there was one other comment that was made tonight uh, here that it says, okay, you start and all of a sudden something changes in the future, you know, but we don't have that divining rod. You no, know. mm -hmm. but, but once you start pouring concrete, it makes it hard to change. So I, so I do, I do have another comment. Um, and so and Mr. Buer mentioned last time, this is significantly parcels are in the flood zone, the current flood zone, that the revised flood zone, that parcel, all three of those parcels has considerably amount of that property. How does all that have an impact? Yeah, um, <laughs> that would also affect their ability to develop um, and it's not necessarily a limit on the impervious surface. It would be a change to how they're constructing the structures. Because if you um, comply with new, I don't, I don't know how to say it, yeah. but flood sensitive building yeah. techniques, you can still have the higher impervious surface. You're just building it differently underground in order to allow water to flow. Yeah. Okay. So it's, it's likely more expensive, yeah. but it is possible. Yeah. Okay. And then um, no other comments on that. Uh, property on that, uh, okay, so I do have on the 05. Can I, do yeah. my, oh, my sorry. first? You can you finish, mind? okay, sorry. 
sorry. <laughs> and we've talked about this at length, but I just wanted to highlight a few things that are new for you this evening. So um, again, state law says you have to allow mm -hmm. these types of um, housing units in either where hotels are or where residential um, building is allowed. There's also a state law that says you cannot require um, additional occupancy, spacing, and intensity of use on these types of housing, permanent, supportive, and transitional, as well as emergency, um, than you would for other types of housing. And then, was as mentioned in testimony, Lakewood is supposed to be planning for 637 emergency housing units and also 1,238 permanent supportive housing units at the zero to 30 percent area median income. This is the summary again. You've seen this. Um, other than on the right two columns, there's a change where we're now referring to emergency housing, emergency service overlay potential. And um, let me, if you don't mind, walk you through these maps just to show you the effect of what that overlay might do. So this is kind of a weird looking map. You're not used to seeing it like this. What this shows is nothing but where residential of different types is allowed in the city. The darker colors, generally speaking, are more um, units per acre. The, the lighter yellow, that's the residential R1 through R4 zones. The others are higher density. If you were to say now, where are the hotels and motels allowed, which is where you need to, or you must allow all four of these special needs housing types. Um, it is all on the east side of the city, as you can see within this blown up uh, rectangle. It's the downtown, it's the Lakewood Station, uh, transit oriented commercial, and then it's also C1, C2, and C3 within the city, but these are all on the east side. This is a map of the proposed um, overlay. It's a little ref more refined than you saw last time. Um, it's this teal area within the city, and the purple is, again, the air corridors where this would not be allowed because of safety. This little weird colored part is still part of the overlay, but it is public right away near I-5, which is why it doesn't show as being where you would build. But again, what you're seeing is east side of the city and then down in Tillicum and Woodgr Woodbrook is where this would apply with this overlay. It is, I'm sorry, a little less than uh, half of all of the residentially zoned acreage within the city to do this overlay this way. It is also primarily in the places that are both um, medium or high social vulnerability uh, identified by the CDC and also areas of higher displacement risk according to an analysis done by the PSRC. So when you get into what do you have to do right now by this state law? This says, yes, we are following that. What it does not address, and it quite frankly doesn't have to this year, but there is a requirement in 2024's process to look at equity and, and racial disparity. So it's a, it's a comment to say, either you talk about that now or you talk about it a year from now, whether to have this go through the entire residential area of the city, or go with the minimum now and then deal with that question later once you get into the 24 review. And either one is, it's up to the commission. So um, uh, quickly, there is some information that would be added to the comprehensive plan, some of which you saw last time. There would also be um, those changes here within the code itself as proposed. Long story short, you have a section that says in blue here, there is a chapter in the RCW that governs how foster care facilities are run, and that would be a reference to that RCW chapter. Then you have a section specifically about special needs housing. Subsection C here lists all the different types of um, conditions, development and operating conditions. And then if you look at what would be in the table, you see emergency housing and shelter would be allowed within the overlay. And then permanent supportive and transitional housing would be allowed as permitted uses with conditions, which is not the same as a conditional use, um, through the commercial zones. And then at this point, they are a conditional use also in public institutional. The required submittals, I think we went over last time. There's really not a big change here. Um, as was mentioned in the public testimony, though, the thousand foot radius is still there um, because of a decision after conversation internally with staff, if you say there isn't a distance, um, how to say this, if you don't require a certain distance between these structures, they may all end up very concentrated within particular parts of the city. 
And two things there, are you quote ghettoizing an area or are you by saying it's only gonna be in these smaller areas saying we're not gonna hit that 637 unit total if we don't do it in other parts of the city as well. So again, it's a, it's a subjective thing that we've included in the staff recommendation, but those were the two reasons why. Excuse me, just on that comment, sure. I, that was my thing. Um, what's their main, the um, property owners, why are they so uh, against having that thousand feet? Because what what's the reasoning of? Primarily, if you remember last time we had that map that shows where the current hotels are, yeah. many of them are closer than thousand feet. Oh. And um, so it may be, I don't know this for a yeah. fact, but it may be that they are thinking for future pur purchases either for oh, themselves oh, or for other providers, okay. there would be a difficulty in, in purchasing oh. those hotels to convert to mm. emergency or supportive housing. Mm. It would be a matter of more new construction being required than that conversion process. I don't know that for a fact, but I, that was my first reaction. You could also, you know, the, the issue here is, is the city meeting its minimum obligation? You know, there's no requirement that we provide more. Um, and then the thousand feet was something that came up as a result of taking a look at existing hotels along the strip and finding out generally what the distance is and the number of units. There's a total of 1,100 units, as I recall. And is there a sufficient number of units to meet the 640? There could be, and it may very well be in the future that the city has to amend the thousand foot separation. But we haven't denied anyone's request. And so I still think the code has proposed code has some relevancy. Okay, thank you. Uh, do you have more than Tiffany to? No, that was it, Mr. Okay. Chair. Thanks. Go ahead, Mr. Combs. First, oh, Mr. Carson. Carson was first. Okay, <laughs> cool. I wonder where private property rights enter into uh, all these uh, the state requirement, like uh, deed restrictions on current land use uh, whereby uh, whoever built a subdivision would say uh, minimum one acre lots and one uh, dwelling per parcel only, uh, how that fits and how, how it uh, governs the uh, uh, government's overlay uh, uh, function of, uh, uh, of this uh, enacting this uh, this uh, work. HB 1220 was passed in 2021, and that's the one that has the requirements for emergency and permanent supportive and transitional housing. I'm not aware yet of if any challenge has been made on the basis of um, HOA, CCNRs, or anything like that, limiting the ability to meet those requirements. The 637 units for emergency housing is brand new, straight like within the last month from Department of Commerce for Lakewood. And then the other requirements that just were passed by the legislature within the last few weeks for at least two ADUs on every private property parcel, et cetera, is so new, it, you know, the ink isn't even dry. So all of that to say, historically, CCNRs um, have been found to, uh, I, want, I don't want to say trump or, or cover or defeat, but they have um, in some ways limited the ability for the legislature to do some of these things in the past. Mm. Court cases haven't happened yet right. over time. That may change. As you're well aware, the legislature right now is very active on housing and they may be um, intending to push this in the courts when the time comes. I, I just wondered where, uh, where that factor uh fit or not yeah there wasn't any explicit discussion. conversation about it in the bill I didn't, I didn't see any of it right and that's why i wondered right where, 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 uh, thank you mr pearson um had a couple of questions um so in reading this it doesn't seem like there's any way to really control where this happens for um the uh permanent supportive housing and the transition housing that's just a free-for-all anywhere is that State law requires it's anywhere that there are hotels and also anywhere residential units are allowed. So can we also, you know, if we wanted to put um, a spacing limitation on, on that or no. is that? No, that's anywhere you can allow it. You can, it has to happen. That, that's real clear. The difference between the emergency housing um, uh, shelters and emergency housing units and the permanent supportive and transitional is made 
the in-state law because of how they are run, the size of what they are. Okay. Um, and they are just considered basically to be a big family, meaning number of people in a house or in an apartment building. Um, is there any way to, um, and I guess, depending on the, like, the type of permits that are required for these, um, you know, would there be any way to like, if there's going to be more people there, you know, that's more pedestrian activity to impose additional like frontage improvements or connectivity requirements or any sort of uh, things like that? No, state law is also explicit. You cannot do anything different on the regulation of these as you would on any other residential. So you would have to change the whole residential code if you wanted to build a residential house and you wanted to you know, limit this at all. Then Correct. You do frontage improvements and all this stuff for a single house. Okay. Correct. Um, and then another question. Um, let's see here. Oh, there's another comment, I guess. Um, I, I would just, I don't want to really, I would recommend just doing the bare minimum and not, uh, you know, um, doing anything more than the state requires us to do. That would be my recommendation here. And then, you know, evaluating whatever we have to in 2024. Okay. Um, and then same thing, uh, as Mr. Beaver had noted, uh, just keeping the thousand foot and seeing how that goes. If we need to adjust that in the future, we could, but at least, you know, it doesn't seem like there's been any, any issue with someone getting permits right now. So, um, just and other jurisdictions do have distance yeah, as well. Yeah. That's where it came from in the first place also was the comp the Department of Commerce gave us some best practice recommendations from jurisdictions that had distance separation. Yes, Mr. Bewer. Something that we have not talked about, uh, and it's going to be separate from this, is uh, there's uh, some discussion going on in the department about making sure that permit supportive housing, transitional housing, et cetera, is subject to the rental housing code. So that means there is a process by which the city of Lakewood just takes all of these units, considers them to be rental units, and every year we go through and inspect a certain percentage. They pass, that's fine. That, that there is assurance then that they are meeting minimum health and safety codes. Mm -hmm. And, and the like. And then we require that of all other rentals in Lakewood. And so why would we not, yeah. whether single family or multifamily, so why would we not in this case? Yeah. So that's something that's on the table that hasn't moved forward yet. Okay. Any other comments, Mr. Combs? You had one? Uh, I'll, I'll pass on comments. Okay. All right. Nothing new to add. <laughs> okay. So then we're um, come back on the uh, May 17th or what would the think it is? May, yeah, May 17th is our next meeting. Correct. And so if there are any requested amendments that you would like to okay. send to me for inclusion in the packet for all of you to see, um, feel free to do that. Otherwise, next uh, meeting is you starting to decide if you're ready to take action. There'll be a motion in front of you to consider and discuss, amend if you like. And then if you do decide you need more time, again, you're welcome to do that. Yeah. Great. Any other? Nothing. So uh, I don't see, it was Mr. Mboki wasn't on tonight? No. So no reports from him. Any other additional reports from staff? No, Mr. Chair. From any other commissioners? Hearing, seeing none, we'll call the meeting adjourned. Thank you. Oof.